Hi, Jessica. Thank you very much for co the coordination uh, of this and many other webinars. We appreciate it. And um, we have the uh, complete honor to have again, back to back weeks, Dr. Patrick Lillis from Overland Park uh, in the Midwest. So um, Dr. Dr. Lillis, thank you for joining us. Um, if you could give me a minute, I wanna just go over quick um, who we have here. Uh, so Dr. Lillis is a terrific friend, an unbelievable professional, and runs a private prosthetic practice, um, both digital and uh, unbelievably comprehensive large case presentation. And um, he's an incredible wealth of knowledge, uh, speaks for many companies and dental manufacturers. He uh, received his bachelor's in biomedical science from Marquette and a doctoral of dental surgery degree from Creighton University. He also completed his residency in advanced restorative dentistry at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So with that, Dr. Lillis, thank you for taking time out of your day. And we are honored and look forward to hearing your uh, presentation for the next hour. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, John. And I want to thank uh, Jessica and John and everybody at DSG for putting these together. These take a, a tremendous amount of time. So thank you again for, for doing that. And also uh, to the audience, feel free to uh, definitely put something in the chat box and we'll, we'll follow those and answer those questions as we go along and especially at the end. So please feel free to do that. I know, uh, thank you to all of you for coming on. I, if you're like me, it's been as I've been saying, death by webinar. Uh, we've had so many webinars going on. And so thanks for the opportunity to come this afternoon and listen to a guy from the middle of the Midwest um, give a little presentation on post-COVID. There's been a ton of information been flying around. And so hopefully today we'll help organize that and, and share with you best practices. And you know, the beauty of dentistry is that there's so many different ways that you can do it. And, and we'll just give you a little slice of how we're doing it here in the Midwest and um, talk about what we're doing as far as opening up our practice. It's changing nationally, but here in Kansas, we're set to open up uh, a week from yesterday. So next Monday, uh, we'll be seeing our first gamut of patients. And we had our team meeting yesterday to kind of get ready to go. And so we'll kind of share with a little bit about how that went and what we're doing going forward. So Hopefully it'll help all of you out uh, going forward and uh, look forward to kind of going this today. So uh, John kind of mentioned a little bit um, as far as, hold on a second. John kind of mentioned to you, I'm gonna, hold on a second, I'm gonna start you back up here. There we go. So John little, mentioned a little bit about uh, who I am and I'll go over that just a little bit, but I, like he mentioned, I, I got roped into the Jesuit training program, so to speak. So I did my undergrad at Marquette and I went to Dallas School of Creighton. And then I did my postgrad training at uh, UMKC here in Kansas City. And that's ultimately the place where I landed. But 75% of my life is spent here in private practice in Kansas City in Overland Park, which is about five minutes from my office. And then the other 25% um, is doing this. We do uh, quite a bit of lecturing and I also do, a, I run a dental consulting business as well. And what I'll give you a little bit as we've been going along, what we've been talking about with our docs and what we're doing as far as that's concerned with COVID. So, you know, last time, if you were all here last week, you know that we talked a tremendous amount about vision and clarity. And then we talked about personal growth and exploration. And then we really hammered home clinical stuff. So scanning, how, we intro, how we're incorporating that into our practices. And... Uh, today is going to be completely different. Uh, today, actually, we're going to really discuss marketing. We're going to discuss dental team. And then we're going to really talk about internal business systems. So this is kind of the behind the scenes of, of, of spinning down teeth and doing operative and fixing removable prosthodontics. This is going to be a non-clinical thing. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in our practice, getting up to speed, because it's going to be completely different how it was when we turned the lights off mid-March. And and that's essentially when we kind of closed the engines down in our practice would have been about mid-March. So we're looking at a total from wire to wire about six weeks. Um, so I said I've been on sabbatical for six weeks. I really have. 
But if you're like me, I think we've kind of felt like this during our time off where we're kind of getting pulled in different directions from um, our team and our patients and uh, our manufacturers and different things like that. And so it's been a really kind of a tumultuous time. But today what we're going to discuss is really how do we get back up and running quickly. And one of the biggest commodities that we have in dentistry, even before COVID, and, and if any of you have ever heard me lecture, you'll see me that you'll see this slide. And, and I, I always say, and I say this to my dentist that I work with, that you know the biggest commodity that I have in dentistry is time. And time is is really important. And how we spend that time in our practices really dictates what kind of things we're going to have or what kind of fruit we're going to have towards the end of, of the year. And so, you know, the best marketers in dentistry that I know of really are, you know, there's right brain, left brain, right? And so right is your creative side, left is your organizational side. But dentists that are creative, I think will become, will become curious and I think they'll thrive. And what I mean by that is because if we look real quick at like Mark Parker, who's the CEO of Nike, you know, I do a lot of reading about other industries and try to like bring them into dentistry because I think there's a lot that we can learn. But Mark Parker's, this is his sketchbook on the right side, and he keeps us at his bedside. And so sometimes he'll literally get up in the middle of the night, he'll think of something, and he'll start just writing and, and, and putting down in his sketchbook. And his sketchbook now has become pretty popular. You can see it. And these are just different things he's thinking about with shoes and things of that nature. But I always tell my dentist that I'm working with, I'm like, get a blank piece of paper and just start writing stuff down. Anything that comes to your brain, just make it so your brain bleeds and see what you come up with and then go from there. And so we talk, we go through our, we go through a lot with our doctors about that. But I wanna first of all, I wanna start with systems. Now you've heard this over the years as far as lectures go about systems and why are they so critical and, and what are they? And I'm gonna really go through it today actually. Uh, real tangible things, not stuff that's pie in the sky. I mean, stuff that we're using in our practice. And I'm not saying it's the right way. I'm not saying it's the only way. It's just stuff that we've, that I've gleaned off my mentors over the years and helped implement into our practice. And we've had some good success with it. But why they're so crucial, especially now, has been they really help scale up or scale down the practice. And, and you're gonna see here in a little bit what I mean by that. But we're also able to manage overhead in a quick manner. It improves efficiency. That to me is the, is the key. And you heard me say it last week is that it's really truly about efficiency and predictability. So I meet, when I'm meeting with my doctors and I'm talking to them, I'm like, okay, how long does it take you to do like a molar root canal in tooth number 19? And the answers are kind of all over the place. Sometimes it takes some doc, they get it down. They can get it done from step one to step two to step three, and they know exactly the finish time when they're done. That's a predictable procedure. And some doctors are like, well, sometimes it takes me 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes me two hours. And I said, well, if, if you can't put a stop clock on it, then it's it's not, it's not predictable. And predictability is really the key, in my, in my opinion, about dentistry. And all that really, at the end of the day, really funnels into profitability. Okay, so some common things I'm hearing in the past month or so from different, talking to dentists is, you know, I need to cut salaries because I'm not sure if my patients are gonna be around when I get back. And maybe I can add more tasks than onto another system. So. Maybe if I cut the salaries or I eliminate a couple team members, maybe I can stack more stuff on this person or that person. And maybe we needed more work um, odd hours to attract new patients because I need to be more um, need to be more competitive in my marketplace. And none of these things actually, uh, all of the, all three of these bullet points could be true, uh, but they could be true too. And so I would say those uh, some of these times we as dentists, me included, by the way. We have fear, you know, I mean, we have fear. We have fear that we're going to go bankrupt. We have fear that our patients aren't going to come back. We have fear that um, the case acceptance is going to go down. We have fear that our team members, you know, our team members aren't going to come back. They're going to do career changes. Um, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. I'm not going to be able to pay uh, my mortgage. So things of that nature. So we have fear. But the acronym that I saw years ago that I really like is fear is, is sometimes, and most of the time, it's false events appearing real. And I had this conversation with one of my team members recently. Um, she's really, she's concerned. She's concerned that she's going to get the virus and bring it home to her family and that she's going to infect her mom and her aunt who are older and her grandma. And those are concerns of hers. And so it's, it can be paralyzing. So systems really are designed pretty much to get rid of fear. And they're there to decrease stress. 
And I always tell everybody is that systems run your business, not people. And what I mean by that is like, let's say that Kelly runs the front desk. And let's say that especially now when we're kind of getting through post COVID is that now let's say that Kelly leaves. So now I got to find another Kelly. That's a really hard thing to do. It's a bad idea. Versus if you have somebody where you have Kelly, but she's running systems, let's say that Kelly's not there anymore. We can bring people up to speed quicker uh, just by plugging and playing. And they just have to then just run the systems. We don't have to find another Kelly. And then also patient's behavior is dictated by my office system. So for example, if it takes a patient 90 days to pay me, it's because I don't have a system in place for them to pay the copay at the time of treatment. So that's kind of my fault. So patient behavior really truly is dictated by what I do in my practice. The sweet nectar, and especially as we get a little bit older, and I know it doesn't seem like it, but we do get a little older, and I know I'm kind of turning the corner right now, if you want to use a golf analogy, and I'm probably playing the back nine holes as we speak. So you're going to need, I'm going to need, we in dentistry are going to need intense predictability, especially as I get closer to 50 years old and or 50 or above. I'm going to need a lot of uh, predictability because predictability is really, in my opinion, what leads to profitability in dental practices. And remember, it's really not how much I produce in my practice. It's really how much I get to keep. And so I always say that team fatigue, a lot of times when I'm meeting with dental team members, is a lot of chaos and disorganization. So when I'm interviewing team members, I always say, you know, how are things going in the practice? And a lot of times they'll tell me, um, I'm, I'm super stressed out. I, I leave at the end of the day, I'm just beat. Um, I take it home to my families. You talk to the doc and it's kind of the same thing. So it's never too late to change. And, and a lot of the practices that we work with are not, some are startups, we have some young people, but we also have some older practices that have been practicing kind of like me for a while. And they're coming in and I say, Pat, listen, I can't keep going like this. You know, anything we can do to help, let's do it. And so I always say, you know, fatigue with the team, dentists, doctors is really due to chaos organization. And nobody really does systems better than Starbucks. Now, Starbucks in Kansas City, and I'm sure like in your area has been totally closed and we can't get there. Starbucks is not the best coffee I've ever had in my life. In fact, uh, I'm kind of a coffee idiot at home and I like to like do all the you know, coffee stuff. And I have like a full coffee ridiculous thing at home, but, um, the, but the coffee is predictable. It's serviceable. I know that when I'm in the airport traveling and lecturing, I know that I can have a cup of Starbucks coffee in uh, Massachusetts. And it's the same thing I can get in Overland Park. But when you go into Starbucks, they have these boxes and, and on the side of the box, they have, one, they have six different check parts. So when you stay in, you say, I want uh, I'm Pat Lillis, I want X, Y, and Z. And the person that's talking to you, they're literally writing on the cup and then they pass it to the left. I'm per I don't think that the person on the right, I don't think they really know who each other are, um, but they don't need to because you can literally write on these six different boxes. I think there's like 85,000 different combinations or something like that. So it's a really well-run machine. There's a Starbucks in Kansas City about a mile from my practice across from the Sprint headquarters, which now merged with uh, T-Mobile but they have 350 customers an hour on a Thursday morning. It's the largest producing Starbucks in the nation. 87,000 different combinations that you can do at Starbucks. Now imagine 87,000 different combinations. Five days of training, and they do this five days of training to look up and address customers. And they really sell human connections, not tasks. So they get it right all the time, but sometimes, you know, in our offices, we can't really find where to put the health histories in the right place, right? But they pretty much get it right consistently pretty much all the time. So I would say systems really do not need to be complicated, nor do the treatment plans. And let me repeat that. Systems don't need to be complicated, nor do the treatment plans. I... I'm a firm believer that the, I, I, I'm a firm believer in the power of threes. And what I mean by that is when we get into consultations with patients and we're giving patients options, I do not give them any more than three options. So I do option one, option two, and option three. Because through studies, we found that patients really can't comprehend anything more than threes. And they really truly then can make decisions with threes. It's amazing. Anecdotally, I, I found this to be true. When I give the fourth option, and, and it, sometimes it's really tempting to give them four options, I found that it, the patients get confused. 
So we try to say, let's try to do something complex and let's try to make it simple, okay? And Apple stores is a really great way to, to think of this. When you go to the Apple store, the very first thing, it's a total system. So my sister-in-law works for Apple and she basically broke it down how the store works. It's really incredibly intuitive. And when you walk into an Apple store, you're greeted by the person, right? You can't sometimes even get in the door. And sometimes you don't even want to talk to this person. You just want a peripheral or, you know, a CD or something. You don't want to even talk to anybody. But they really truly try to flag you down. And then they try to get you into the correct spot. And they have a whole system on how they do these things. And that's why that Apple store runs so efficiently. The volume that they do in Apple stores in the sale is absolutely mind-boggling. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about, and we're going to start getting the nuts and bolts here, is developing the team. And you've all heard this. I'm not saying anything that's anything new, but I'm putting a different twist on it. The dental team is the biggest percentage of overheads in dental practices, bar none. It's always the biggest line item that we see on profit and loss statements. And when I see that the systems aren't in place, what happens is that we see too many team members, to be truthful. We see an assistant that really needs a helper. So we see an assistant with an assistant, right? And overhead can be trimmed dramatically with efficiency. So instead of having an assistant with a helper, if we institute some better systems, we can really truly get to where we need to be without as many people. So I always tell my docs to pick key players and then just pay them a little bit more. And you come out way ahead because instead of, carrying all these extra salaries, you can just bump up your current team's salaries by three to 5%. You get a happy team member that's willing to work harder. And sometimes a formula can be one plus one can equal five. And so that really kind of comes down to attitude. And really dentists and team members, we all kind of go through this, but you know, there's, there's books out there and, and there's really, this is my dog is Rocky, but there's really, there are two dogs. You have a, you have a dogs that, are having great days and you have, and you can have a bad day. Whichever dog you feed is the one that's going to eat. So we, as a, as me, as the leader in the practice, if I'm feeding the negative dog all the time, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's the vibe I'm going to put out in the office. And that is totally palpable when you go into the offices and some of the offices that we go into, um, initially when we do our site visits, you can actually cut the tension with a knife. Um, and so it's just interesting. And, and if I'm feeling that, then how are my patients feeling? And that's exactly what it is. I tell my team that every day. When we're big on hellos and goodbyes in our practice, and, and we'll talk about that later, but when somebody comes in, we want them to be greeted because that's really what's going to set the tone for, especially for our existing patients and for our new patients. Okay. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. So this is a model of our practice. And I have four team members. And I would say I calculated the fact that I, my four team members can do the they can do the chores really of 6.5 to seven people. And I won't get into methodology and how I calculated that, but they really can do it. And it's not, and it's that they're high, they are high performers. And it took us a while to get to them, by the way. I've been through plenty of bad ones. But when we got really high performers that really bought into the system and bought into the vision of the practice, what ends up happening is that they will work harder and they want to work, but they also want to work smarter. So if you look at these boxes, you'll see each assistant underneath these boxes. And so Cassie, Janae, Shanda, and Asabi are my four team members in the practice. And the front desk coordinator, Cassie, and then the other front desk coordinator, too, is Janae. Now, Cassie uh, is also what we call our rover assistant. So she can do more than just schedule appointments, but they answer the phone, they collect the money, they manage appointments with specialists, they coordinate with labs, and they schedule appointments. But also, front desk coordinator number one and actually front desk coordinator number two can come back and sit chair side with me every time. Everybody's cross trained, including our hygienist. So that's important is that even the hygienist can sit chair side with us as well. Now, I don't want my hygienist sitting chair side with me. I want the hygienist back doing hygiene. But in a pinch, if something really happened and we had to come in on a day off or something of that nature, we can, we can plug in anybody that we need to. That to me is the key. And what ends up happening is that when I do this, I don't ever have to hire a temporary assistant. So for example, Jay, front desk coordinator two, she's going on maternity leave in six weeks. 
So when Janae goes on maternity leave, I can go down to three people. We'll ratchet the schedule down a little bit. We won't, and we'll, we'll nip our production in just a second, but we'll bring that down a little bit, but I don't have to bring in a temp. And to me, I don't, if maybe it's just me, but temps have just never worked out in my practice. Um, I think being a temporary dental assistant is really hard. It just, for us, it's just never worked out. They either, they're not bought into the practice. We're not sure what little skills are gonna use. Um, we're just not sure, like it takes us a couple days for them to get up to speed. Just never really is a very smooth transition. In this model, uh, in 14 years of practice, I've never had to call in a temporary assistant ever. And so it's been, it's, it's really worked very, very, very well. And so we, we have what we call zones of predictability. And each uh, of those team members are really responsible for their zone. So hygiene zone, lab zone, front desk zone, clinical area zone. And what I mean by that is that each person then that is in these zones is responsible for that zone. So let's paint the scenario where we have front desk zone and they can come back and sit chair side with me, but all of a sudden now they are responsible for that zone. And what I, and I mean by this is that with this, when we broke it up into four zones, then I didn't have the going to the front desk and saying, hey, what, what was going on with that? And I didn't have one person say, oh, that was Cassie's position or, oh, that was Asabi did that or something like that. No, each person is responsible for their zone that day. And we track that because then if I need a question, I can go straight to that person and then they're responsible for that zone, okay? So I would say three things dentists can do is diagnose, they can prep teeth, they can deliver anesthesia. In some states, uh, hygienists can deliver anesthesia. But the most profitable practice is keep their doctors in is what I call production zone. And that's what this is. So when we get back up and going in COVID, and I'll go over this here in a second, how, what we're gonna do, but we wanna stay, I wanna stay in this zone right here. Now, these are uh, pictures of the residents down at the dental school um, in the AGD program that I took. And I, I said, I'm gonna take a picture real quick because that's the production zone, right? Where we want to, I want to stay in that production zone. If I can stay out of the other zones as much as possible, that's great because that's where all the production, all the magic is happening right there in the laboratory. Okay. So one of the things I do with my team members is I try to empower them. And what I what I do is we do these things called growth conferences. Now these are one time a year. We usually have them in January because in the in the middle of Kansas City, it's cold. It's after Christmas. It's kind of a dreary month. It's a good time to kind of re-inject some enthusiasm back into the practice, and it's the first month of the year. So, I each team member meets with me, and I say I want three goals that they want to achieve in the upcoming year, and they get to pick them. So in December, when it's coming up, I remind them like, hey, when we come back in January, you got to have your three goals. The team gets a form to fill out and so do I. So I, they list five things. I want each team member to list five things that they do well. And then I want them to tell me five things that they can improve. Now you don't have to be chained to five things. For example, my hygienist has been with me forever and it's hard to find five things, but she can, she can come up with two to three on each, on each match, on each thing that she does well, on three things that she wants to improve on. If there's a behavior, especially with new team members that needs to be corrected, you can put it on these forms and you can give it back to them and, and then you can put a timestamp on it. So for example, if there's five things that they can improve, I say, great, let's check back then February 2nd or 3rd and let's reconnect and see if we've improved that behavior, okay? So what ends up happening if we don't put a timestamp on it is that those things, they just continue to go open-ended and they never get resolved. So that's the time where I'm sitting chair side and I'm like, Asabi's driving me crazy because she's not doing this, 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 and this. We address those right out of the gates because if I don't, it's never gonna improve. So from the growth conference, then we schedule the salary reviews. And in the salary reviews, we usually have these in December. So I have these at the end of the year because I'm gonna go over this later, but when we get into production and collection goals, if we're over goal, then I know pretty much what I can pay them then the next cal calendar year. And we separate this from the growth conference. And this is important because I want the growth conference to be exactly the growth conference. And I want the salary review to be a salary review. I don't want to mix and match the two. So, and it's always based on overhead and where we are to goal, which I'm going to go over in a second. If we are above goal, then there's going to be a salary increase. And if we're below, we don't even talk about it. So, uh, Production and collection goals in our practice is something that was taught to us way back in the Pride days. Uh, Jim Pride told us this years ago, 16 years ago, actually, when I first started my practice. 
and we've always had it. And it's something that is, tra- I, I, I try to do as much transparency in the practice as possible. And what I found is that when I share the production and collection goals with my team, it's a double-edged sword. If we're over goal, then the team's gonna expect some compensation. But if we're below our production goal, then I don't have to have an awkward conversation with a team member because they know there's not gonna be any dollars there for a salary increase. So it's pretty much taken off all the ambiguity off the table. Then I use a spreadsheet like this, and and you're welcome to get this. I can give this to you however you want. I'm I'm happy to give it to you. But we basically then, as the years go by on the left-hand column, I can go back in and I can calculate this. And this is a, a worksheet that will calculate hourly rates, so what their base salary will be. And these are just made up numbers. I just put them in here. Um, these are not actually her numbers. They're just made up numbers. But um, but we can calculate their hourly rate, which should be, you know, whatever it is, 18, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, whatever you decide that you want the base hourly rate. And then there's a FICA contribution, which is an hourly rate times 0.0765. And then that gives you that number. And let's say that, let's say that we pay her $24.38. That'll come down to $1.82. And then if you have, if you contribute to the your pension and profit sharing, you can get those reports from your uh, investment advisors, and then you can calculate a number, and you can take that divided by A. So annual hours is going to be how many hours is that employee going to work? And what I hear sometimes is like, Pat, I have no clue how many hours they're going to work. And I say, now's the time to really dial that in. Again, we're, we're going to really dial this in as close as you can because we want to manage this overhead. And then if you're giving any insurance to them, health insurance, whatever, you can take that dollar amount and then you can divide it by the annual hours. If you're buying uniforms, same thing. If you're spending $400 on uniforms, take that number, divide it by the annual hours. And then if you're giving a bonus system, whatever bonus system that you decide to do, if you do it at all, you don't have to, but you can put that in there. And what you'll get on the right-hand column is really truly what their projected total hourly employee compensation is. Because what I found with employees is that they're always concerned on that left number there, which is the hourly rate. Everybody's fixated on that. But everybody knows that runs a practice, it's not just that number. That's not actually what I pay out to that employee at the end of the year. I pay out the right number, which is the projected total hourly compensation. Um, my team included, they always want to forget the FICA compensation. They always want to forget what I put into their 401 k um, the uniform, the insurance, all that stuff just gets kind of pushed to the wayside. But we as dentists know that when we're running practices, that's actually the, the number to the right is what we're divvying out per employee. So this, this sheet is really, really important because then I say, actually, you know, you're, if you really want an hourly compensation, we're really paying you then $30 an hour and not $24 an hour. Okay. Or whatever that number is. I'm, again, I'm just using placeholders here for for reviews, okay? So that's been helpful. The team retreat, we have this, uh, we have it a half day and we usually do it in August. And at the, tr- at the team retreat, what we do is we set up our calendar then for the next year. So we know that, let's see where we are, May right now, so May, June, July. So at the end of the summer, we're gonna set up our calendar for 2021. Now, obviously the, the calendar for 2020 is, that's shot, right, because of the, pandemic that we've gone through. But we put this together sometime around August and then we get our sheet next year. And what I mean by that is I put the, all the vacation time in, okay? Both uh, me and then also my hygienist. The beauty of dentistry is you as doctors get to set up whatever you want to do. So I encourage the practices that we work with to take one vacation per quarter. So one week off per quarter. And initially, people look at me like I'm crazy. And I say, if that's not going to be palatable for your number one, two, or three, let's get some systems in place and let's get you to have one vacation per quarter. And then get some, build in some flex days in there. So, for example, I take five to seven flex days depending on the year. And those are what I would call sick days. And so I just kind of build them in, they kind of float. But each team member, when I put my, and I put all my vacation time on the calendar, And when I do this, then my team kind of works around me. Then I put it right back onto them and then they decide when they're going to take their vacation. Again, this eliminates then me having 
three different office staff all at the same time in the office because they're short on hours. All that's going to do is increase overhead. So I, when I'm gone and if hygiene's running, I don't need a full office staff. I just need somebody running the front desk and I need my hygienist working. The other two folks can sit and they can do, they can either go on vacation or they can take PTO days or whatever they want to do. And the staff then starts rotating the days that I'm off. So it really truly does work well when we do this. Um, and then we also go over what we want our yearly production goal to be. And then from that, we start breaking it down. So we then set what we call our production goals. Now, these production goals, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide here, but these production goals really are broken down into yearly, monthly, and daily. And what I did is I pretty much, when I calculated my overhead, so I put my overhead into QuickBooks and I have a whole template that we use and we give practices and that we use ourselves, is that when I put those in place, I think about, okay, this is what I'm gonna have to spend per year. And it's really not complicated, by the way. It does not need to be ambiguous and complicated. But then I say, okay, how much compensation do I want? And, and I have all my goals in place. And that really honestly is what drives the daily and monthly production goals. We have full transparency in the teams. And like I said, it clears up the cloudiness regarding salary increases. And ultimately what I found in our practice is that it superly decreases stress. Now, when, I tell, when we teach this, we say, listen, we're not using production and collection goals to stimulate more dentistry. I view it as more as watching the weather. So what I mean by that is that like, if I'm watching my production goals, then I pretty much know what the health or non-health of the practice truly is. And here's what the master goal should be. Now, these are not our numbers. These are just made up numbers that I put in here. But on the left-hand column, and you may or may not be able to see this, and I can definitely give this template to you after. And, and by the way, anything I have here, you're more than welcome to have. Um, we'll give it all to you. You just let me know. But we have different uh, production goals, collection goals, not only for me, but also for hygiene, okay? And then we have how many new patients that we want to get per month, and we track all these numbers. And basically what we do is then you'll see the days on the top of how many days I'm gonna work. So let's say I'm gonna work 178 days, and we want our production goal to be, I don't even know what it is, four or 5,000 bucks, something like that. And then we say we want hygiene to be 1,000 or $1,200 a day. And again, we're tracking these things and the staff is tracking these things, okay? And it really truly is like watching the weather because I know that if we're kind of at goal, then we're in good shape. And if we're below goal, then we're not in good shape and we have to figure out why are we below goal, okay? So now once we get that established, I tell people we're ready to start tackling scheduling, okay? Now, being in Kansas City, I, I was obligated to throw in a picture of the honey badger uh, for our Super Bowl champ, Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, and you gotta understand, we haven't had the Super Bowl champs, Kansas City Chiefs in forever. We've watched bad football for a long time. So I was obligated, this is my only slide, I promise, uh, to put this in there. But we're, we're, we're ready to tackle scheduling. Block scheduling, here's the key. So people say, well, what's the key, you know, Pat, what's the key to get back after COVID? And I said, here's, here it is right here. Block scheduling. It's really scheduling the perfect work day. What does that look like? For us, scheduling, when I schedule, I want to work smarter and I don't want to work harder, okay? And how I do that is I divvy up my schedule into two production blocks, major, minor, okay? I schedule this to daily and I schedule this to goal. And when we schedule to daily production goals, so if you're seeing a pattern here, we're scheduling yearly, monthly, daily goals. When we do that, we have, what we're trying to accomplish is we want nice, even days, and when I have production blocks, I have nice, even days. And I know for myself now, after practicing close to 16 years, that I know when I'm good and I know when I'm bad. And that's been the key for me is to do the stuff that is more taxing mentally and physically. I personally want to do that in the morning. Some docs want to do that in the afternoon. It doesn't really matter however way you want to skin it. But I tell people then put the blocks into schedule your day into just different blocks. Okay, so how does that work? Um, I talked about the major minor production, but I for us we really truly want to be seventy five percent scheduled a goal by lunch. Now we cut it off. We cut lunch out. So I decided about four or five years ago that lunch to me was kind of a waste of time. I don't like it. I, I I'm not a big lunch guy in the first place. I found that when I took an hour lunch in the middle of my day, it was hard to start and it was hard to stop. 
So what did I end up doing is I just took lunch out of my day and I just kind of eat it in the fly in between patients or whenever it kind of fits in my schedule. And then I decided to, I decided to leave earlier in my day. That just worked better for me. I'm, I'm a morning guy. So we said, well, we really truly want to be 75% to goal by lunch. So if your workday is from eight into four, we really want that to be about 75% by one o'clock. Uh, noon would be great, just sometimes we can't get there. So I would say at least one o'clock. And then after that, we'll break it into our minor production time. It makes for smooth days and a decrease of stress. Um, crown, major production for us is crown, inlays, removal of partial dentures, dentures, implants, larger ticket items. We scheduled these in the morning, okay? Minor production to us is operative dentistry, consults, records, appointments, emergency times, and then also some administration time if you want to build that into your schedule. Again, it's however you want to kind of cut it, but minor production times would be something that isn't just as high a ticket item for dentistry, okay? So if you look at hygiene, this is kind of what an example of a hygiene production block looks like. We pre-appoint hygiene. So before the patient leaves, and I think most offices do this now, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm saying anything revolutionary here, but we pre-book every single hygiene appointment if the patient's comfortable. If they're not, we'll put them on a schedule and we'll start, we have a whole system there, which I won't get into today. But this is pretty typically sometimes what our hygiene schedule will look like. You'll see at the bottom there, there's no appointment. And you'll see, you can't probably see it, maybe, maybe you can't, but in there you'll see NP Profi, that means new patient Profi. What we're doing is we're pre-blocking for new patients into the practice. And we do that because it's important for new patients to really be able to get them in in a relatively timely fashion. So if a new patient calls a practice and let's say I call your offices and you can't get me in for three months, I'm probably not gonna come see you. And that's just kind of the reality of the situation as pathetic as it is. And there are sometimes I might wait, but usually if you make me wait for up to six to eight weeks, I'm probably not going to come into the practice. And so what we've done is we set our new patient goal we know how many new patients we want, and then we will pre-block them in the hygiene. Now, let's say that some people say, well, gosh, Matt, what happens if you don't fill that? That's a wasted hour or 30 minutes, or however you're doing your hygiene. And I say, no, we'll release those blocks at about a week out. So if we get to be about four days out and we don't have that block filled, we'll then pull from the schedule of the hygiene patients that did not want to pre-schedule for that month, and we'll plug those holes in at the front desk, okay? Now, this is what it looks like when you marry the two procedures together. So on the left-hand column, blue, that's me, right-hand column, pink, that's Shanda. And this is a model where we see assisted hygiene, where during the peak hours, if you want to squeak in another couple of patients, uh, you can go to assisted hygiene. There's a whole different animal on how that works, but that's what this model is showing. And sometimes we will do that during peak months. So instead of bringing another hygienist in, I just decided to use one of our uh, floater systems, which would be Cassie, uh, or Janet can do it too, and we'll go through assisted hygiene. On the left-hand column is me. So you'll see, uh, let's see, like at eight o'clock, I had crowns, on, I have a 31 crown, I got a 30 crown, I got two crowns at 30 and 31. Um, and then right about noonish or so, you're starting to see I'm doing a partial venture. And then in the back, in the afternoon, it's seating at Maryland Bridge, I'm doing operative dentistry, consults, uh, seeing some appliances, things of that nature. So you'll see major and minor production times being drawn up uh, between the morning and the afternoon. That today, that right there is our model workday. If you have a big case, let's say you're doing a full mouth reconstruction or something of that nature, then your morning would look different. So your morning would look from eight until noon or one o'clock and be just one patient through that morning. And then again, you'll be doing your minor uh, procedures in the afternoon. And so we like this because it kind of keeps everything floating along nicely between new patients consults. And so we kind of keep things moving in one direction. So Jim used to say this, and I thought this was excellent. He said, you know, dentists have got to know their overhead and they got to know their numbers. And it really is what's going to set you free. And I really truly believe this. I am a numbers person. Um, I'm numbers because there's not much gray area in numbers. It's not left up to interpretation. So that's why I like numbers so much. And that's why I share with my team is because then I kind of get out of the gray situations and I don't get into squabbles with the team. So again, made up numbers, these are not our numbers, these are just made up numbers for uh, explanation purposes. But this is a, what we call a trend indicator sheet. And this is a February, so this is our monthly trend indicators. Again, you text me or email me, I'll give this to you. This is just what we set up for our practices. You can take it and turn it and twist it and do whatever you want with it. 
But this is just a snapshot of what I want to see on a daily basis. I do not want this to be a complicated report. And I want this to be independent of my dental software. Okay. So I look at my total office, total office production, uh, what the goal was that month, what the difference is, were we up or we down? Uh, and then I want to know where we are year to date. Okay. And then I want to know where we are year to date goal. And then I want to know the difference. Okay. And sometimes it'll be below goal and that's okay. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be, we're going to be stimulating any more unnecessary dentistry. I just want to see, okay, are we below goal because we're down on new patients or the consultation? So what this does for me is it honestly, if you, if you go down and you look at the number of new patients and then you, you scroll down even more, you'll see the number of case acceptances. Usually the number of case acceptance and goal, either up or down, is what usually leads to um, those numbers usually will drive, jive hand in hand. So let's say that my total case acceptance is not, let's say it's like 45%. Well, I may not see it in February here, but I'm, I'm probably going to see it. I'm going to feel it in March because that means I've got a problem. So now what is my problem? And what this does is allows me to identify the problem and it doesn't get past 30 days. And so what I mean by that is, is, is we, we have a lot of referring uh, dentists. We, we get a lot of cases from dentists around our city and then also some also specialists. And so it'll tell me, okay, am I not capitalizing on, on the consultations? Am I missing? Am I not dialing in with the patient? Am I not listening to what they want? Am I not meeting them where they are? Like what happened there that were 45%? So it kind of helps me figure out in real time, where am I off? And that really helps. Okay. So then we can go to March and then these are all just numbers. And then we'll actually go through different patients and we'll, we'll basically go through what did we schedule? What did they accept? And then if they didn't, why not? Okay. Now, again, some more things we're seeing here. This is all the same thing. And then that gets us to, and, and the biggest thing with those, with those, with these sheets I just shared with you is again, we do not go back and call patients. We don't hound them for, for work. We just want to, again, know um, why didn't the case accept? Was it money? Was it not? Did we not do our job as far as explaining it correctly? Again, what aren't we doing that we need to do? And is there a problem? That's what I want to know. And I want to know that quickly. I don't want to know that six months from now. And that's what happens But if I didn't have that. I want to know that with it. It doesn't get past 30 days. Okay. And then from there, we get this sheet. And this is our goal sheet. So these are the supplies. And our supplies are 3% of our previous month's collection. Okay, I'll repeat that. It's 3% of our previous month's collection because it should be 3% of your overhead should be your supply. You can bump that up to 5% if you really have to, but we want, I want that number to be anywhere from three to 5%. And that's the goal that, that Cassie uses when she orders. So we put one person in, floater assistant is in charge of this, and she's in charge of the supply budget. Okay, so I demarcated this to one team member, and she does the ordering. So what we do is we have a sheet in our, in our uh, sterilization, and when the girls are low on something, they'll actually write on the sheet, and then they'll give that to Cassie, and then she'll do the ordering, and she does that from week to week. She knows how much money she has in the month then to spend. So We've always done this, and the number one question I get is, oh my gosh, have you run out of supplies? Not once. We've never run, I've never run out of one single supply. But what ends up happening is the, the rep comes in and they've got a special that, that month, right? And then you end up buying 55 pounds of impression material that then expires and all this other kind of junk. So we just say, no, we may need um, some burrs, but I don't have the, you know, here's what he's got. And, and maybe you can give me five burrs to get by. Okay. It seems crazy, but it really keeps that part of the overhead correct because I can wind up with, I mean, one year this, but the reason I did this is because several years ago, this got out of control. Okay. So that's what that is. Okay. So that's that on that end of things. I'm going to switch gears for just a second. And I want to look at profit centers in the practice because complex procedures not all the time lead to profitability. And what I mean by that, so full mouth reconstructions is the hot topic right now. And a lot of times when I look on, you know, I look to CE, everybody's talking about come to my CE center and I'll teach you how to do a full mouth rehab. Um, we do tons of full mouth rehabs. Okay. It is not the profit. It's not the profit center in my practice. I promise you. And we do a ton of them and I know how to do them. 
and there's still not a huge profit center for my practice. And I'll explain why here in a second. So I want to look at three things. Simple dentistry, single zerk crown, three unit fixed partial denture or bridge, and a single tooth implant. Those are kind of the three hallmark procedures that you can do in a common restorative practice anywhere from Kansas City to San Francisco to New York City. And if you look at the single zirconia crown, let's say that you're going to prep the tooth, you're going to impress and you're going to provisionalize. And I'm just going to use generic numbers. These can be either over or they can be under, but they, the numbers are all placeholders, right? Um, for you that are scanning, you can replace that with scanning or impressions. Again, it doesn't matter. But let's say that, let's just say for argument's sake, you can do, you can get a patient from start to finish, numb them up, prep the tooth, get them out the door in 60 minutes, okay? Let's say that you then get the crown back and you seed it and you ingest it and you cement it. And let's say that that takes you 15 minutes. Now, somebody's taking five minutes, somebody's taking 10, I, somebody's taking 30, I don't know. But let's just say this takes 15 minutes. The total chair time for that procedure is an hour and 15 minutes, okay? Again, these, you can dial these numbers any way you want to. Um, let's say that uh, the zirconia crown fee is not $1,200, <laughs> that's a typo. Let's say it's a couple hundred bucks. Um, let's say that, you, oh no, let's say your crown fee is $1,200. That can be 700, it can be 800, whatever you have on insurance, it doesn't matter. And let's say your lab fee is 120 bucks. I don't know what it is, but again, you can use these numbers any way you want. This is just dialing these numbers and formulating a model. Well, you have a potential profit if you're running a pretty lean and mean practice that's pretty well run and you got a 50% overhead, you can, you could potentially make about 600 bucks an hour. Uh, but that's, you know, so that's running at 50% rate. If you, what I like about this number is you can see if you raise the overhead, then the profit goes down. If you, if the crowd fee goes down, then your profit goes down. So again, play with these numbers and you can see how much you can produce in an hour. But the single zirconia crown on a molar bread and butter dentistry, that's probably one of the most profitable things that I can do in my practice. And the practices that we work with, that is also one of the most profitable things. I can dial it in. I know exactly how long it's gonna take me from start to finish. It's very predictable. For most of the time, the two, you know, unless the tooth goes to endo or whatever, but that, you know, that's, that's a less than 3% time. It's a very predictable procedure. It's very hard to get in trouble when you're doing these procedures. It's a kind of a bread and butter dentistry procedure that oftentimes gets overlooked. But when you're post COVID and you're trying to really boost uh, production and you're really trying to produce profitability, do not sneeze on the post zirconia crown. It's nothing sexy, but it'll definitely get the job done. And patients will usually case accept this because it's a need based procedure. Okay. So we go into, let's go to a bridge. Sometimes you're going to have to consult with the patient. Let's say that's 15 minutes because it's a higher uh, level of production. You prep and provisionalize uh, and scan it however you want to do it. You see it and adjust it. Let's just overshoot it. Let's, take, let's say it's going to take you 45 minutes to get this thing in. That shouldn't be like that, but let's just err on the side of caution and says 45 minutes. Let's say the chair time is two and a half hours. Let's use that same $1,100 fee. So let's say it's 3,300 bucks. Let's, use this, let's say your lab fee is 660. So your net alloy production will be about thousand bucks at a 50% overhead, okay? So again, it's not a bad day at the office if you can produce that. Now, the biggest thing here though is implants. So let's say that you're gonna scan this tooth. And so there's, here's, here is the most profitable thing in my practice that I looked at last year, is that when the implant comes back from the oral surgeon, again, this is gonna be a molar that does not require a temporary crown. There's differences between posterior and anterior workflows which I'll get in, into another lecture at some point down the road if we come to your area. We have a whole system of anterior and posterior workflows. It's pretty slick, it's very predictable, um, but it's not for today. But let's say it's a posterior iOS scan. You seat the abutment and then you cement the crown. Now, on, most of the time, uh, these are coming back from the laboratory uh, together. So we do almost consistently, 100% of the time, screw retain restorations in the posterior. Cannot tell you the last time I cemented a crown on an implant. So we're doing, most of the time, we're doing all screw retained uh, restorations in the posterior portion of the mouth. Let's say that takes you 15 minutes. So let's take, let's say you take an impression of the scan is 15 minutes. Let's say you see or abutment, you see the abutment, you submit the crown, that's another 15 minutes. Your total chair time on that procedure is 30 minutes. The restorative fee, I mean, this can be ranging from $1,200 up to, I've seen sometimes $3,100, but let's just say it's 2,100 bucks. Again, that's just a placeholder, that's not my fee. Um, 
let's say your lab bill is 580. That's oftentimes less than that, but let's just say it's 580. You can sometimes produce about $1,500 at 50% overhead. Now, again, you play with these numbers however it suits you, and you can kind of dial in to see what your net hourly production is per hour. That is a very predictable procedure in a sense that the cheer time is minimal. You didn't have any anesthesia. You didn't pack any retraction cords. You didn't really, most of the time, don't really have to numb up the patient at all. Um, it's an extremely predictable and no aerosols. So that's the key here too, is that, that you did all this without creating any aerosols, which is huge post COVID. So a friend of mine, George Priest, uh, is a prosthodist friend of mine, came up with this literature article years and years ago. This is all the way back in 2004. But how he communicates it to his patients is there's really a seven year return on investment to the patient. So the, the red line is the implant and the blue line is the fixed part. That's the three unit bridge. And he said that really at seven years, that's when the patient gets a return on investment because we know that the patient's gonna pay more for the implant than they are the three-year bridge. And that's a common question that we get from patients still to this day is, well, gosh, if I do the implant, I know it's less invasive, but you know, it's gonna be cheaper to do the bridge. And we say, not necessarily. Initially, it could be. And we share this literature chart with them. I would say this was done back in 2004, but if we were to look at this today, I would probably say that red line is pretty darn flat because George in that literature article talked about the majority of his implant failures was, wasn't the implant failed, it wasn't the above and failed, it was the chip porcelain. So the porcelain chipped off the crown, the crown had to be replaced, most of them porcelain fused metal restorations. Um, and so that's what he found is to be replaced. Now with full contour zirconia, with custom abutments, screw mentable restorations, everything's customized. I would guess if we were to redo this study in 2020 going beyond, I would, I would probably say we're gonna see a, almost a flat red line. I think the days, that was the only reason he had things replaced. So it's a winner for our patients. So other factors to consider, no tooth preparation, no tissue packing, lots of times no local anesthetic. And a lot of times I'm post here, I don't have to provisionalize and no trauma to adjacency. So the bottom line is simple implant dentistry is the most profitable. It's easier than routine restorative dentistry and, and, routine, and, retain, and routine dentistry is more profitable than endosurgery, et cetera. And all this depends on predictability. That's the name of the game. So it stimulates internal referrals and reputation. What I mean by that is that if you were to do a procedure wire to wire and the patient didn't really have any complications, the chances of that patient going back out and giving you a positive review online and then telling all their referring, all their friends and family is probably gonna be pretty high. But if you're like me, I'm terrible at endo. I don't like endo, I hate it, I hate it in dental school. I never did it in practice. That's not why I went to my residency in. Um, and I goof the endo up and it takes them forever. I mean, now they're going to tell everybody how bad of a dentist I am. So again, it comes down to really um, whatever your comfort range is and how good you are in those certain procedures and just really pounding out those procedures day in, day out. And if you don't love them and you're not good at them and they're not really profitable, then I would probably tell you to punt and get rid of them and focus on the stuff that you love to do. How was I? So implant penetration, this was, w, this was sent by the WHO group years ago, about 2 million implants were placed since the early 80s. That represents 2% penetration of potential dental implants. There's 15 million people walking out with, with fixed prostheses in the United States. It's a huge market penetration. And a good friend of mine, Bob Marges, who's a general dentist in Des Moines, who um, you, many of you know Bob, he's a huge lecturer. He said, Pat, give me single to two tooth implant dentistry all day long. Now, Bob is a very good dentist. He does a ton of composite, beautiful composite work, um, does a lot of reconstructions, things of that nature. But he, Bob will tell you the same thing. I'm telling you is that the most profitable and most predictable thing you can do in your practice is the stuff that doesn't get a lot of fanfare, and that's the, that's the single to two tooth dentistry, either behind implants or on teeth. Okay. So I got a couple more minutes, and I want to kind of go through marketing real quick. But this is something that is important, uh, not only for your practice, but this is also a, a sucker of money as well. And half of our marketing budget is really truly wasted. And I don't know which half of it is. And that was said by a, a friend of mine who's a general dentist in Kansas City who all may have realized this, but they said, yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I have no idea. I can't track, I can't retract my return on investment. And I told him, I said, listen, if you can't, if you cannot track your return on investment, don't do it. And that's the same thing in my practice when I'm looking at technology. If I can't tangibly look, if I'm getting something out of something, I'm not bringing it into my practice. It's plain, it's just, it's just simple. So the best marketing is always existing patient to potential new patients. 
And what I mean by that is you just, it, it, my grandpa used to say, my grandpa was a general dentist and I grew up next door to him in Iowa. And I love this quote because it's so true today. If you want to grow a practice, do a good job. If you want to grow a practice, then do, just do a good job. And it'll take care of itself. I think that's true. So marketing really in our practice is everything. It's everything I, I can feel when I walk in the practice, how the receptionist greets me, is the facility clean and organized, does the staff even know my name, and it's the energy I feel when I walk through the door. So if you walk through the door and you don't have any of these things, the front desk person's slouching down, they're on their phone, um, they're preoccupied, they don't say hello to you, these are all sets the tones, okay? Advertising. Advertising for me in my practice is just the mechanics of marketing. It's the thing I pay for. It's usually what dentists do in practices slow and new patient numbers are down. Marketing, but marketing can't fix what I mentioned before. It can't fix a bad patient experience, a lack of successful systems in the practice, a bad dental team, and it will not make you an overnight success, no matter how much you or me want it to do. So here's what I look at in our marketing budget in our practice. I look at it as a 60-30-10 rule. So 60% is gonna be internal marketing. These are gonna be things that I mentioned here a little bit, tangible things I'm gonna do for the patients that are coming through the door that already come to see me that already like me. 30% of it is going to be like-minded businesses. And what I mean by that is physical therapists, massage therapists, plastic surgeons, um, like-minded businesses within healthcare, um, boutique practices, internal medicine boutique practices are becoming very popular. And then the external marketing is crazy. It's only 10% in our world. And next year, actually, we're shrinking this down to 2.5% because what we found is that our external marketing patients just aren't that great. And all the external marketing we're doing now is through our website. So it's usually flip-flop. Dentists will usually place like a $9,000 ad in a high-end magazine. And then sometimes what you'll get is like two patients looking for a deal. Now, this isn't always the case. This has just been my experience. I know some dentists that this works out great, but if you're gonna spend $9,000 on an ad in a high-end magazine, I better see a, a good return on investment, okay? And if I can't, I'm not doing it. And during those monthly, those monthly indicators I showed you, we, there's a line item for this. Intro marketing gets you like-minded patients. They're already coming to see you. They already like you. So why not capitalize on it? Other businesses could be personal trainers, like I said, physical therapists, occupational therapists, concierge medical practices. So I tell my team every day, it's kind of like singles and doubles, okay? And we really truly want to market towards women. And it's not that we're sexist, but what I found is that women really do rule the world. 75%, and this is, this is, and I'd say this because it's backed up by literature, 75% of women make healthcare decisions. That's kind of true in my, in, in, my, in my household, and I'm a dentist, I'm a healthcare provider. They do, most, most men just kind of want to see what their wife thinks. They do not want an in-your-face sales pitch. They look, feel, touch, taste all the experiences, okay? And men, we just really, truly don't get it. And my example is that my wife will tell me certain things sometimes, and they'll be like, so-and-so is in a fight. And I'll be like, I don't, I don't think they are. And she's like, yeah, they are. And they just are more in tune than we as men are. So we're big on hellos and goodbyes. My staff will tell you, this is one of the most single important things that we do in our, that front desk person better say hello to the person when they walk in the door and they better darn say goodbye, okay? Those are two lasting impressions that patients will really truly remember. It's a simple thing that gets botched almost in every practice that I see, okay? So like I said, I wanna track my marketing budget. Is it internal, in, external, internal? And I use an Excel numbers worksheet. And I have to work with real numbers where these marketers are working. And if they're not working, I'm not doing it, okay? I'm not doing it. So internal marketing examples. These are just some examples of what you can do. You can get super creative. That comes back all the way to that second slide that I showed at the beginning of the lecture. Patient of the day. I don't know who does this, but we do this. And what we do is we rotate this. So like we got these tumblers recently that are, like in the summer we'll get these, these, these tumblers. So people can put their ice water in them and we'll put all what I call crap inside of it, like lip balm, uh, referral cards, um, I don't know, a, a thing that cleans their glasses. I mean, it's just crap, right? But people love free crap, I'm just telling you. Um, how about handwritten thank you? So on pretty much once a day, I will sit down and I will pick a patient out and I will just write them a thank you. Four sentences, I address it and it's out the door. And then sometimes I'll have my team sign it and sometimes we want one and sometimes we want five a day. It doesn't take long, it really works well. And my team will do this too. My team will actually write a letter to a patient too. And we have these little cards that are made up and we can give those to patients. Starbucks cards, this thing has gone crazy. It's soft marketing. 
we use these pretty much all the time. And we'll either use it sometimes if in the rarity that we're running behind, we'll give these to people like, hey, I'm so sorry we're running behind. Hey, here's a Starbucks card, have a coffee on us. Um, doctor will be with you in just a minute. Sometimes we'll give it on referrals. We just hand these things out like candy. Um, we track to how much we're handing this out, but it's a really, it's been a big thing. Referral ladders. This is where you have to be kind of careful, but uh, if patients refer to other patients, you can send them movie tickets, gift cards, and things like that. But the problem is, is that once you start this, it's really hard to stop, okay? Uh, flowers, women love flowers. And we send flowers to work because what we found is that a lot of times people say, where did you get the flowers? And she'll say, from my dentist. And then the next question is, well, my gosh, who is your dentist, okay? It's $45 for a bouquet of flowers. I can't tell you how many new patients we've gotten because of flowers, okay? Uh, smile reminder, this is a, uh, we use this, there's, gosh, there's, so much, there's too, tons of, of these things out there, but it can tell your patients, it's just basically a reminder that sends out of our patients, but instead of sending them also just reminder for their appointments, we will send them reminders actually for what I'm doing. If I'm giving a lecture, uh, if I'm going to a course, uh, whatever, it's super easy to use and your patients will be super impressed on the continuing education that you're doing. You can do it today. You can send out a thing, Dr. So-and-so took a course from Dr. Pat Lillis, blah, 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 blah. Feel free to jazz it up and your patients will like these things, okay? Uh, we do a two card system um, where we give them one card to give to the referrals and another card that basically has our social media on it. Uh, before, after care calls, uh, that's, that's nothing crazy. You've all been doing that, but anything that gets a handpiece gets a call. Um, I'm sorry, I put one more cheese picture in there. Um, but we always say we want to go on offense and not defense. If we found that if we do these things I just mentioned, if we do these every single day, the singles and doubles every day, then we find out that we just don't have the dip in new patients. So don't feel free to ask, don't, don't miss asking your team, what are we missing? Get them thinking about what to do. Information is not enough. I think we need to start selling emotion, especially now, okay? Coffee table books are good. You can put your teams, your bios, your pictures, et cetera. They're kind of labor intensive to do. We've had moderate success. Um, we had good success with these. Canvassing our cases, cheap, easy. You can hang them in the office. And then when you're done with them, you can give them back to the patient, which has been really great. So a case that you're super proud of, you photograph it afterwards, you put it on your wall for a month or two, have the patient, you know, rotate it and give it back to the patient. They really like it. Show off your stuff in your office. It's free marketing. If you did a case that you really love about it, don't put it in a drawer. Don't put it in the software. Show it off. Okay. And then the last thing I'll talk about is web presence. This is really, really key in my opinion. This is actually what you'll see a new website that's going to drop hopefully in about 24 to 48 hours. We completely revamped our entire website. That's what we've been working on for three weeks. People under the age of 12 have absolutely no idea what a phone book is. If you ask my kids what a phone book is, they'll look at you like a grimoire, right? we have to make sure our websites are top drawer. That's what people are, they're basically now coming to our websites and that's what they're judging with this. Keep it fresh with updates, devote a budget for this and do not skimp. And you wanna increase as much Google juice as possible, which is in the lecture for another time. And I hire an admin for this, just like I line an admin for the year. So I put a person in our office in charge of the website, in charge of freshening up and talking to the web coordinator. Own your domain and develop it, make sure it's an easy URL, update it monthly, make sure the photography is really good. And before and after pictures jumps 10 times on the hits. So befores and afters are huge, huge. This is a com this is our website, it's getting completely redesigned. But we do feature cases on it. This was Bonnie DeShelley, she was an international superstar patient. Uh, she lives in South Africa, we explain her story. Um, it's again, it's really hitting emotional parts of the thing. Here's our reviews that we put online. These reviews are really important to put on our website. Um, we drag people to this all the time, okay? Pat as many good reviews as you can. People these days will go out of their way to say something bad about you. One or two bad comments will be swallowed by 177 good ones. So it's important, it's important, it's important to get positive reviews. Social media is great. Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, these things are all great. You, you can decide which media platform works for you. It can be a big practice grower and I've seen it work but it does have to be driven constantly by the practice in order to be effective. It's not something you can just kind of do once in a while. We are not big on social media practices. We focus more on internal systems and our website, but we do have a presence and we do update it periodically. And email to us is huge. Uh, people live on their email. Get email addresses, 
stay in contact with your patients through paperwork and email. Email them that you took this course today. Stay up, to keep your patients informed on what you're doing. If they open it, fine. If they don't, that's no big deal either. Okay. And Peter Drucker, who I think is writes incredible textbooks, says the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customers so well that the product or service fits the person you are serving and it sells itself. I think that's it's an incredible uh, quote. So thank you again to DSG uh, for giving me here. I know we only had an hour and we went through a ton of information. Um, you know, we can we go through these more and more in person or on webinars that are a little bit longer. We can dive deeper into a lot of these subjects because there's so much things to go over. But at least want to give some kind of tips and tricks on what what's going on and what we're doing in our practice. And hopefully, hopefully it helps you all out. And I, I feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, send me a text. Um, you can email the staff at, at our office. Feel free to talk to them. They've all been there a long time. They understand the systems just as much as I do. Uh, have your team reach out to our team. Um, we do that all the time and they're happy to do it. So uh, I feel free to like welcome any questions that you all have. And uh, thanks again to John, to Jessica, and all the team at DSG really for putting these things together. Um, I always say DSG to wrap them up is a company with a heartbeat. They truly do care about what they do and they're trying to make dentistry better. So thank you again for all the hard work. Thank you for paying it. Thank you for being here and paying attention. And I really hope this did help because that's really truly the intention. So thank you. Hey, Dr. Lillis, uh, this is John Rule. Thank you very much. What a, what a great, um, great tips. Wow. That was packed. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to ask a question in your personal experience. Um, you talked about non aerosol restorations, right? Um, yes. So outside of a single unit implant, uh, what are, what are some of the restorations you believe are going to come back quicker than others um, when you decide, you know, when you decide to go back into practice? I think, you know, John, that's a really good question. I think if the things that we're doing, if you look at our schedule next week, the very, very first things that we're doing, we're doing a lot of just routine dentistry. So the first probably two to three weeks, it's going to be housed with, um, I would say probably single unit crowns, quadrant dentistry. We're going to be seeing some emergencies. Obviously, there's we think we're going to get pounded with emergencies, um, and so we've kind of pre-blocked. What we've done is we've pre-blocked out some that. So the first week back we have that we know that we're going to be productive that first week, but then the second week back, those pre-blocks we actually held some of those pre-blocks for the emergencies that we're going to see that first week back. And they're going to be really honestly just routine dentistry, one to two units, things of that nature. So things, what I'm trying to get at is the systems didn't change. We're just reworking our systems. Does that make sense? Like we're, we're just going to be doing a lot of those things. We have a whole slew of posterior implants that are lined up. Those are the things we kind of shoved to the beginning because those are non aerosol procedures and they're high production tickets and they're routine and they're predictable. So you'll see that we, we're doing a ton of posterior restorations and even anterior restorations on implants because again, those produce really very little to no aerosols. I mean, posterior restoration on an implant doesn't produce any aerosols. So those are things that we're doing, John, initially to kind of get back in order. We're just following the systems. We're following the pre-blocks. We're, we're blocking and tackling. We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not panicking. We're just going to continue to work the systems that we have. Great, great input. But, and I'll reiterate, we got some great feedback. What a refreshing lecture, Dr. Lillis. Um, <laughs> good, I'm glad. Go. Yeah, you know, we get hammered with clinical or, you know, fear or the banks or that. You just gave a really positive, awesome lecture. So um, for anybody on this, uh, I, I want to say, please reach out to Dr. Lillis. Um, and again, I've gotten a few text messages already personally, look out, you're going to be getting some requests to lecture here for some surgical groups. I can tell you Good. this, so, um, but I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, Jessica, is there anything else you'd like to add in before we close or is there any, um, other questions 
But again, thank you, Dr. Lillis. What an amazing job, and it's an honor. Thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you for the invitation, and thanks for having me on. It really is an honor to be here, so thanks for having me here. Hey, we got another comment in the chat box, John. Um, uh, doctor, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pronounce your last name, so please forgive me, but his comment was, after 35 years in practice and two months out of the office, this helps me fall in love with dentistry again. Oh, good, good. Good. Thank you, oh, Dr. Oh, that's great. And uh, we will have this web and this uh, lecture as well as the one from last week on digital workflow. It is, uh, the recordings are posted up on www.dentalservices.net backslash social. So um, please feel free to review or show um, your office and what Dr. Lillis has to share. So thank you again. John, do you want to close this out? Sure. Thank you, everyone. And I appreciate your time. As always, uh, it's an honor, Dr. Lillis. Be safe and stronger together. We'll get through this. Absolutely. Thanks, John. All appreciate right. It. Thanks, Take guys. care, everyone. Bye, everybody.